Okay, so hopefully as, as, as you're beginning now to see, basically the whole kind of, you know, like trend is that the further on we get in this, the less and less things make sense. And this becomes really important when we start talking about like trying to have, you know, conversations between different observers in the universe. You know, if you're, if you're um, engineering a, a rocket ship, and you need to make it to a, a certain specifications, certain length, whatever, certain burn time for your engines. Now, I, I think you start to see where the problem is. If you're designing a rocket ship and you're sending your plans to any other observer in the universe, your measurements may be nonsensical to them because what 10 meters is to you is going to be very different than 10 meters to someone else. So if you're trying to measure things specifically in the universe, your measurements are no longer any more trustworthy than any other random measurements and none of them disagree. So that's why, th that's where things stand right now. That we have some, basically like, it's almost like chaos is, is you know, governing the world. That we no longer have any sort of a way to agree on, um, you know, who is more correct than the other. That's what the, quant that's what the, the, the um, idea of space-time invariance is. These are quantities that no matter who you are, no matter what reference frame you're, you're using, no matter how fast you're moving, these are quantities that all observers in the universe will absolutely agree on. So that's why this is such an important concept. We need to find some way to talk about things that everyone will agree on without having to worry about those slight differences that change from reference frame to reference frame. And so just as a basic everyday example of this. So imagine we have a giant pole. <laughs> that's what I have in green there. And imagine there are two different observers with two different reference frames. So the one that I've drawn in black here, we have a x, y, sorry, x, y, and z coordinate. I think it actually looks like this, x, y, and z coordinate in black. And then at a very different angle, I have completely arbitrarily rotated in red some other observer's coordinate system, x prime, y prime, z prime. So basically there's someone standing there looking at, you know, facing the normal direction and they have their sister like held up at an angle and their sister is looking at the world from upside down, you know, at a completely reoriented axis. So what I want, or the, the question now becomes, if the, the person who has their normal coordinate system, we'll call it S, the, the, the normal black coordinate system here, if in S, if you were to measure how far that pole is going in the X direction, what is the extent of the pole in the y direction and the z direction? If s measured some extent in x, extent in y, extent in z, so here they'd say it goes a little bit to the right, it goes a lot up in the z axis, and you can't really tell in the y how I've drawn that. Um, they will get certain values of this. Now in s prime, in the red frame, if they measured the extents along their axes, they're going to measure some value delta x prime, delta y prime, delta z prime. So they're going to tell how far that pole is oriented along their x prime axis, which is not necessarily going to be the same as the normal x axis. So the s observer is asking for, for x, how far does it go to the right? The s prime observer, when they ask x, how far is it going in this direction? Um, I, I think I'm screwing that up a little bit, but these values will almost certainly not match. That one will almost certainly not equal that. This one will almost certainly not equal that. Delta Z will almost certainly not equal delta Z prime. I, I hope that's clear. I'm trying to draw upside down not equals two sign there. So their individual measurements based on their alignment of their coordinate systems necessarily causes them to disagree on their individual components. Is there something they would agree on though? And hopefully you see, yes. It sure as hell better be the case that they both agree on the total length of the pole. And so basically it's saying, you know, if that wasn't true, what that would mean would be that if you look at like the height of a house and then you turn your head, if that didn't hold, then as you turn your head, the house all of a sudden becomes taller if you look at it like that, than it does like that. And that's clearly not true. Your orientation should not affect the physical properties of a separate object. So those two reference frames, even though they disagree on the individual uh, components, they absolutely should agree on the overall extent of the thing. And they do. How do we find that? The way, the way to measure that is, oh, let's, sorry. Um, the way to measure that is the Pythagorean theorem. They both agree on the 
over all a distance, but not necessarily in the delta x, the delta y, the delta z parts of it. So they both agree on the total length and specifically the way we calculate that, L, <coughs> excuse me. Now, if, it's a, if we're holding it only in two dimensions on an xy plane, obviously delta x squared plus delta y squared. For 3D, it's just delta x squared plus y plus z. And then same thing, L prime equals delta x prime squared plus same thing. And I'm not going to prove this, but it's actually a very straightforward proof. If you, if you want to try to find the, um, any arbitrary rotation between two component systems, there is what we call a, um, a, a three by three rotation axis. That rotation axis, uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but turns out when, when you apply that rotation axis between the, component, the coordinate systems, that, rota that, that rotation matrix strictly changes the directions, but it, not, it does not stretch the axes. So we call it a unitary operator, or sorry, we, a special operator. Uh, there's a, a certain name for special operators in mathematics. That simply means they don't uh, stretch or compress objects. They simply change orientations. And specifically, without proof, L equals L prime. So this in three-dimensional space-time, er, three-dimensional space coordinates, this is what we call our metric. You can calculate an invariant quantity by simply using the Pythagorean theorem. So even though your individual terms will vary, when you sum them up like this, the result will not. And that's the basis for how we deal with space-time invariance. Same thing. Some quantity that when you measure it in one frame and the other, by doing some uh, exact operation, which is consistent every time, you always end up with a result that matches every other frame's result too. So I'm going to erase these here and let's take a couple of guesses for what our space-time interval might look like. Okay, so let's look at this from the point of view of not just 3D Euclidean space now, but let's look from the point of view of 4D space-time. So we're now going to, instead of using uh, uh, coordinates x, y, z, we're now going to call, refer to events where each event A or, or event B is going to have three spatial components and one time component. So I'm going to call event A, I'm going to say it has components X, A, Y, A, Z, A, and T, A. Now notice I'm viewing this as a row vector. And same thing for event B, I'm just going to refer to this X, B, Y, B, Z, B, T, B. And to be clear, these are as viewed in reference frame S. And it's entirely reasonable to assume there may be any other number of uh, frames S prime, S double prime out there, whatever they might be. And we can assume that they have their own different measurements, X A prime, Y A prime, Z A prime, and so on. And what I want to ask now is, if you kind of do the same thing, if you want to treat this as like a a four-dimensional triangle now, if you measure like some extent in the x, delta x a, or sorry, delta x, delta y, delta z, delta t between them, we can, we can try to kind of um, recalculate that, that uh, quantity by adding up their squares. So let's try this. Let's imagine that we're going to define some invariant quantity, and I'm going to write it slightly differently than I had before. I'm, I'm going to write, um, I don't want to use the word L now, I'm going to use the word, uh, you know what, I will just use L, or L squared. And this is just, this isn't going to be the, the final version of it anyway, so, so we'll adjust that when we need to. But let's say instead of L, we'll talk about L squared, and let's just try this. Based on our Euclidean geometry, Let's try delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. Now, if we have a time component, let's just add that on, squared, plus delta t squared. And to be clear, delta x means xb minus xa, delta t means 
TB minus TA, and so on. So what I want to ask now, if we, if we define this to be the sum of those squareds, what I want to ask is, does L, or L squared in S, agree with L prime squared in S prime? And specifically, the way we're going to test that is if we take our variables in S and if we apply the Lorentz transformations, will we get the same result in S prime? So that's a big question. If we uh, Lorentz transform those coordinates into the same coordinates in L prime, do we get the same result? Okay, so I've gone ahead and written up the Lorentz transformations. Now, again, this is sp uh, specifically for motion where two reference frames are offset by motion in their x or x prime uh, coordinates. And again, you can always rotate your coordinate system, so that's true. And now what, uh, what we're gonna do here is in calculating these quantities. Now, I'm gonna be a little bit kind of devious here. And instead of talking about finite quantities, I actually want to refer to infinitesimal quantities. So I'm kind of changing these on the fly, ignore what I'm doing here. But um, you'll see why we need to do this here in a moment, because really what I want to do is I want to relate a differential change in x to differential changes, or differential change in x prime to those in x and t. So I'm just going to turn this into dx and v dt. Same thing right here dx, and there's a, there's a dt and a dx there, and these just become the same. Okay, so I'm going to uh, write this. By the way, one other uh, thing to note, when we're taking the time component dt squared, we do need, to, in order to keep our units the same, I need to multiply it by c squared. So I've just kind of arbitrarily added in a c squared dt squared. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I have some expression for what the length prime would look like, in my prime coordinate system. So I'm assuming that I've somehow measured each of these things and my primed uh, observer has calculated their uh, length according to this metric or this system that we're doing. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the equivalent expression on the right hand side here and I'm going to replace like for example I'm going to replace dx prime with this. I'm going to replace d, uh, dt prime with that and the seeds, the, the c squared that goes along with it. So, um, first of all, I do want to point out that this is exactly equal to dy squared plus dz squared. So the y and the z part transform exactly as is, and I, therefore I'm going to completely keep them out of the picture from here on out. We don't even need to worry about that. So, let's focus only on the x and the t. Now, dx prime squared I'm just going to square this, and now you're going to have that cross term. So we have gamma squared times dx squared, and I'm going to look at that, plus v squared dt squared minus 2v dx dt. And then we have dt prime squared is... Same thing, gamma squared, dt prime squared, or sorry, just dt squared, I should say. And I'll compute the, the outer term there, plus v squared over c to the fourth, dx squared. And here's the cross term, minus 2, oops, sorry, minus 2 v over c squared uh, dt dx. And again, we're not worrying about the y and the z. Okay, so let's go ahead and add these up, and we will find that there might be some cancellations, or there might not. Okay, so let's go ahead and add those up here directly. And uh, so, it's a little sloppy, but all right, when we add those up, uh, first of all, everything is going to have a gamma squared. And I'm going to try to account for all of these here. I have a dx squared 
plus v squared dt squared plus dt squared plus uh, v squared over c to the fourth dx squared. So I've taken all the, the dx squareds and dt squareds out. And then I, I have my two cross terms now, uh, minus 2v, and then my, my terms are 1 plus 1 over c squared dx dt. Okay, so that should be everything there, and I do believe I've actually done the analysis properly. If you don't trust me, pause it and work it out for yourself. And at this point, we see that we can, in fact, collect like terms. You can take the 1 plus v squared in front of the dt's. You can take the dx squared plus that. Here's the thing, though. No matter what we do to this, this will never translate into dx squared plus dt squared. There's no way to cancel out these cross terms or anything like that that will get rid of everything except for dx squared plus dt squared. So we know that the dy and the, and the dz will translate to dy prime and dz prime just fine, but the sum of these will simply not transform into the same thing. So this is a dead end. You can work that more, you can do more analysis, but it's for not because that's never going to simplify into what we want. So what that means, what the, the metric that we are applying specifically, the way we're adding up the space-time coordinates will not be invariant. Because as we see, when you add those up like that, you're gonna have leftover cross terms that no matter what you do will still be in the way. So one observer will necessarily calculate a different result if they use that property than another. And, and, and again, I don't wanna get bogged, bogged down in the details, but the fact that you can't convert from one another is really important. Now, now that we've done the wrong thing, we're gonna go through it properly, and I think you'll see why everything actually does transform exactly as is. And there, there's actually some really nice algebraic cancellations here. Um, I almost feel like this should be a homework set, so I encourage you to um, try to do this analysis using a very slightly different metric. And specifically, the one change that I'm gonna make is we'll subtract that last term. And just by making that one change, we're, we're gonna see where that leads us here. So I encourage you to pause the video right now and try to work that out on your own using those same transformations because it is kind of a nice happy accident at the end that you get out exactly what you started from.